it's uh, framed a little bit differently than what legitimacy and democratic deficit questions usually have, in that it asks which democratic legitimacy um, for the EU institutions. So I must compliment our talented students here that they are uh, actually considering the options of several ways of having legitimacy with, the, with regards to the EU uh, institutions rather than simply looking at whether we have a legitimate system or not. Because of course legitimacy can be a lot of things and mean a lot of different things to uh, different people across Europe. Um, first of all, I'll just try and say a, a very sort of uh, brief introduction on this topic, but really I think that this is an opportunity to have a, a discussion with the speakers. The second one is obviously to uh, join us still, but um, as the course is not new, but falling in a time where we have a crisis and perhaps the most explicit problems of legitimacy as debated widely both in the populations um, in various media forms but also actually in people's daily days life we see the effects very explicitly. I think that um, the debate also asked for so many various um, angles that this is what we should try and get out in the debate rather than simply have statements on uh, uh, single views. So I will ask you to, after having heard a bit from our one speaker and hopefully a second speaker, to also engage with the debate and, and uh, ask um, your questions following all of this. So basically, um, as I said, already said, uh, it's not a new topic. We've seen the dilemma of legitimacy and possibly a democratic deficit uh, in relation to the EU institutions from the very beginning of the creation of the e uh, European project. We've had this um, conflict of the union of people and the union of states, as it's stated in the treaties, that have to be reflected in the institutions uh, as they've been built. Now. That conflict is really apparent at the moment, also at national level. We see pe the people uh, have uh, specific demands to their governments, sitting in one institution and the people being reflected in another, i.e. the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament. And those two institutions are also in daily day decision making, still having to um, overcome this dichotomy of um, the two profiles of the European project. Now, um, as these problems have been apparent over the decades, I think that today is actually the time where we have it most explicitly because it also translates not only from the EU level in terms of the institutional construction, but directly into national politics. And so I could possibly start off with one argument in this debate that as we're seeing the um, uh, challenge to national democracies, we've seen nine governments fall since 2009 and because of the crisis and political situation both economically and politically at the EU level, this now translates into effects directly applicable to national level politics as well. So the people and the governments are of course closely relaxed, uh, uh, connected but at the same time, the democratic uh, connections that we have and the uh, democratic criteria we have at national level have not been met at the EU level. Of course, one can question whether it should be the same criteria we ask for the uh, European institutions, but some criteria must be put in, put in place. And as the students know, in academia you usually have this division between input legitimacy and output legitimacy, i.e. what goes into the processes of electing the representatives you have for the democratic process and the democratic decision making and, uh, and the uh, outcome focus. So do we need a system that delivers and that uh, reflects the interest of the um, people or do we also need the people to have transparency and an ability to participate in policy processes 
beyond what we've already seen. Good to see you. So, um, to sum up, basically, having these various forms of, um, of legitimacy and criteria for how democratic representation uh, is supposed to look like at national level, and having some of these very criteria also reflected at the EU level, of course, decisions have to be made about what structures are the most uh, appropriate for something that is not a state, but is not uh, an intergovernmental organization either, only. So um, I will straight away now uh, be able to introduce also our second uh, speaker tonight, and I think we're very fortunate to have two um, very interesting perspectives on the political and the economic crisis um, today, and the legitimacy issues that arise with that. So well, first of all, let me introduce uh, Janik Nord, who is a consultant for the BBC and other media um, organizations on European affairs, in particular um, in relations to economics and democracy. Um, you have a background in the financial sector, uh, but also a big interest in the political processes that are to govern, um, or should have governed, uh, some of these, um, uh, this sector as well. Um, I'm also pleased to introduce Nicolo Rinaldi, who is an MEP from Italy. Uh, you were elected in 2009 and now sit as Vice President for the Aldi <coughs> Group. Um, I have, some years ago, established an organization called VoteWatch.eu, a transparency organization, and I just looked up your profile. Uh, you add VoteWatch, of course, which was very impressive and active. Um, but I can therefore also tell you that um, Nicolo does a, a very act, has a very active role in the International Trade Committee in the European Parliament and is a, a substitute member for the Human Rights and Development Committee. So I will really um, simply start with passing on the word to first uh, you, Janusz. Yes. Uh, well, that, uh, I mean, I, as, as my uh, co-speaker said, democratic uh, legitimacy is not a new subject in Europe. Uh, it's been uh, an academic uh, debate for a very long time at the, during the creation of Europe and after especially the, uh, uh, the Lisbon Treaty or the Constitutional, uh, European Constitution uh, Treaty. Uh, having said that, uh, the situation we, we, we are right now, I mean, uh, I'm not an academic and uh, I'm not an MEP, so I'm my view is uh, trying to be as pragmatic as possible uh, in terms of uh, European policy and what is the impact for people. Uh, and where we are right now, uh, we are really at, at a crossroad where it, it can't be an academic uh, conversation. It has to be something that we have to work on uh, right away because we, this, right now, uh, what we saw with government uh, losing election one by one, as well as uh, unrest uh, in some part of the of uh, southern Europe or other part of Europe, uh, you you have a, a real dichotomy between uh, what is the official uh, EU policy, the austerity policy, uh, which is uh, advocated uh, through uh, uh, mainly through the European uh, the European Council and uh, through the via the leaders in Europe, and what the population wants. Uh, and um, more, uh, more than that, every new government uh, that win the election uh, have a population which is dead against uh, uh, what is seen as European policy, uh, but everybody know at the same time that the room for, uh, the, the room for uh, uh, negotiation and the room for changing this policy is, uh, is quite, uh, it's quite small because uh, most of country already signed treaties uh, that will limit uh, their national, uh, let's say, their national rights in order to to have a very different policy. So we, we see, and the situation can't really continue for a very long time because you can't have uh, most of the policy coming from uh, uh, the head of state in Europe and sometimes a couple of head of state in Europe, not even uh, all of them. I mean, we had uh, Mercosi for years. I think uh, now Monty uh, uh, have uh, quite a lot of gravitas and, uh, and can impose his point of view uh, to uh, uh, Angela Merkel. We, we yet to see if uh, 
what, the, what uh, François Hollande will be able to achieve uh, in those discussions. I mean, we had Mercosy. Some people told me we're going to have Frangela now because, uh, but I'm not too sure about that. And uh, so, what, what I, the, my point is that there's really a, there should be a sense of urgency about those matters. It's not academic matter anymore. We have to see step by step how we can improve. Uh, the point is not to see if there's a perception of uh, democratic uh, uh, deficit or if it's a, a deficit of credibility. We, the, the point is not to uh, try to pick one word or the other. It's try to see in the process the way we elect people and the way people vote or the way the decision is made, how we can change it to uh, make sure that in the opinion of, uh, of voters in Europe, uh, they, think that Europe, they think that the institutions that govern uh, the, the continent uh, do work uh, in their favor. And that's, that's going to be difficult. Okay, well, Nicola, perhaps I can start off with simply asking you, um, you have uh, a background also in many um, international settings, uh, both previously to uh, your current uh, position as MEP and in your work for the European Parliament. How do you view um, the current situation and are you as uh, pessimistic, uh, I would say, um, as Janok? I, I, I'm afraid I am, because we, we are facing a, an unprecedented situation. Um, I believe that if you want to be successful, you probably need uh, a combination of two elements. The economic factor, a project that brings prosperity to the people, world, which is able to uh, activate some kind of uh, dynamics. Uh, on one side, and then the human factor. So people who believe that, uh, well, what you're doing is uh, something positive, yeah. um, uh, producing uh, some kind of uh, um, sentimental energy and uh, uh, motivation for the collectivity. Uh, today, I think for the very first time, I've been in the Parliament uh, as a staff uh, Deputy Secretary General for about uh, 19 years before to be elected as Member of Parliament. So I, uh, I've been in a position to watch different phases of the European Union construction, uh, Maastricht, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, the constitutional failure, etc. But I think this is the very first time when we are under attack both from markets and from citizens. And that had never happened before. Sometimes we had the support of the economical uh, sector. Mm. And maybe people were a bit more skeptical, and that was, for instance, during the, the seasons of the, of the referenda in uh, France and in, in the Netherlands. Uh, sometimes we didn't have uh, much economic uh, um, support, but citizens were absolutely behind. And Eurobarometer polls uh, were very clear about that. They were absolutely behind uh, the, the project. Uh, today, market mistrust the European Union. Uh, they don't believe the answers that we are uh, trying to give uh, are the correct ones, and uh, people mistrust. So it is very, very, very difficult. Uh, the, the, the answer to the crisis, which actually goes very uh, immediately on, on the topic of uh, democratic legitimacy, it is to reinforce the European Union through uh, intergovernmental uh, cooperation. Um, which is something that from the federalistic point of view is extremely disappointing, uh, of course, and something which brings two consequences. One is uh, a lack or certainly uh, a reduction, substantial reduction of uh, national sovereignty. Yeah. Um, for me it was very clear, I had been a couple of months ago in Washington DC with my uh, group leader, Guy Rostet, we did meet a number of uh, people in Washington and uh, the State Department. It was very clear the kind of messages that they, they gave to, to, to us. The European Union as such is not an interlocutor for the states. That's not a surprise. It has always been the tradition of the, of the, the Americans. Uh, but they point out uh, to two EU member states as member states that they still have a policy which is worthy to look after. 
uh, to talk to, to see what they are uh, preparing. And this is the United Kingdom, because uh, they are stepping out in a sense, or certainly in a different position, and Germany. All the other member states, uh, France, Spain, Italy included, all of them, uh, they are considered just following the German, uh, uh, the German agenda. That was the perception in, in, uh, in Washington, correct or incorrect? But certainly it is very true that through this intergovernmental uh, method, method uh, we do have certainly a lot uh, of less uh, national uh, sovereignty. Um, the budget law of Ireland, it is very much discussed uh, in Brussels more than in Dublin. Uh, the time and the people who are going to be the solution for parliamentary crisis uh, uh, in Italy after Berlusconi, uh, it has been something very much dictated in, uh, in, uh, in between Brussels, Paris, uh, Berlin. Do you want to go to elections? You cannot go to elections. Do you want to pick up that person in order to be the next prime minister? No, we do prefer it is, uh, it is uh, uh, Mario Marimont. Very similar situation in Greece, of course. Uh, so at the moment, the Greeks uh, wanted to, to have a referendum or to, for Europe or not. It was a decision which lasted one day. Yeah. One day. Then Brussels <laughs> said, no way you, you, you have a referendum on it. And this is true for, for Portugal, for Spain. It is also true for Germany to some extent, because it would have been absolutely uh, unbelievable uh, five years ago that Germans would have transferred German uh, uh, taxpayers' uh, <laughs> funds to Greece. Uh, now they are obliged to do that uh, because the system uh, provides, uh, uh, requires this kind of uh, interconnections. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and and I, I, I do believe Germany at a certain moment, in spite of its no national sovereignty, would have to accept uh, Eurobond uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in due time. After they got uh, budgetary discipline, mm -hmm. uh, they want to have budget disciplines. After they see that there is budget discipline more or less everywhere, they got even something yes. which, in my opinion, is exaggerated, the constitutional value, the constitutional law on, on, uh, on, on budget discipline. Uh, I think they will go uh, there. And that's one point, which from European point of view, I in a sense, I'm not shocked. There is less national sovereignty. Uh, but the other consequences of the intergovernmental method is that there is not democratic, uh, uh, full democratic control. Um, who is actually going to take these kind of decisions? Europe. What is Europe today? It's a very ambiguous concept. It is a number of people a number of institutions, nobody is really accountable. The Commission has a limited role. The Parliament, it is a bit pushed uh, uh, away. So it is the Eurogroup, it is the Presidency in, uh, in, uh, in, in charge, it is the Permanent Presidency, it is an informal summit, it is uh, a galaxy of, uh, of, of people and of different bodies which is uh, uh, not very well defined. If the citizens want to complain, co to complain with Europe, it has no address. You cannot really send your complaint to, to, to anybody. And when I have to take the floor in plenary on the um, Euro crisis, well, I have to address myself first to the President Barroso, then to Commissioner Holy Rehn, then to the President Juncker, then to the President Farron Paul, then to the President of uh, Denmark or, or yes. Tusk when it was there. So it is uh, at least five different people you have to address your your, your own concern as, uh, as an MEP. For a citizen, of course, it is even, it is even uh, worse. Uh, treaties uh, are decided, of course, then there is the parliamentary ratification, but with not clear mandate, any specific mandate from the, the national or European parliament, not really a specific mandate from, from, from the commission, everything through the intergovernmental uh, a method is uh, lacking, and I'm afraid that transparency is making much, much more serious the uh, need for uh, uh, legitimacy and accountability. Okay, but still you're saying that the intergovernmental method is the way of actually uh, getting the system to deliver on the uh, various critical points that we are facing at the moment. So far, it was the quickest, the quickest way to achieve uh, some form of this decision. Uh, the problem going forward is if you, it, it was, uh, I mean, it was supposed to be uh, something for a few months. I mean, this, it was a summit was supposed to, to solve a crisis, which was uh, mm -hmm. the last crisis. But you, you can't go on for years and years and years because otherwise you have plenty of institutions, plenty of uh, 
so-called president or com you know, commissioner, then, then no one knows exactly what, uh, what they're doing. So you can't continue doing a big decision with two or three head of state in a, in a locked room uh, somewhere in, a, in Moselle. It, it will, it, after a while, the population will not take those decisions anymore, as, as we can see already. But what accountability mechanisms would you want to see also in the current situation? So now that bailouts are being discussed and hopefully not renegotiated, but at the same time there is a process that has clearly not finished, how can citizens, parliamentarians, both at the European level and at national level, actually hold their governments to account in this, these decisions, even if it's only a few of the governments that actually take the word? And one of them, one of the uh, one of the solutions could be for domestic parliament uh, MP to uh, actually do part of the work uh, in uh, in Europe. Because right now, uh, uh, obviously, since the uh, since the Lisbon Treaty, they they you know they know the draft uh, legislation from the uh, from the Commission. They have a bit more they have a bit more say about the way the decision is made, but. It, 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 they, they are not actively uh, involved in the process. So that you know, involving uh, uh, involving part of the, uh, every country's uh, MP uh, in the decision process could be uh, could be uh, a good start. I mean, I, I don't know if you're, what you think about this. My, my answer to the first question is, uh, is definitely not. So that it, this system does not deliver uh, a successful solution, uh, and the results are there. Crisis is, uh, is, is deepening, uh, and again, the mistrust from the markets, uh, mistrust from the public opinion creates a sort of vicious circle. So uh, um, it, it is extremely difficult, more and more, to to, to catch up the, the public opinion. As a, a representative of citizens, I believe that again, the human factor is is crucial. You cannot overcome this kind of crisis if you don't have somehow the people on, on your side. You, you, it, it will never work. And uh, the only way to have uh, people on your side is to have democratic institution at European level. Uh, the, the national parliament absolutely has to play the role. Through the Lisbon Treaty there is a number of the orange card, the yellow card uh, of, of, of provisions which are there in order to reinforce uh, their, their role. So far they have not really uh, made uh, full use of, of this kind of provisions, but it might be just a matter, a matter of time. Uh, but certainly the only possible answer, in my opinion, and thank God I'm not the only one in the European Parliament to, to believe so, it is that we need more Europe, but more Europe at the communitarian method level, not at the intergovernmental uh, method. Uh, it is very difficult uh, for uh, citizens to accept any kind of economic dictate from question mark Europe, not well defined Europe, because it is Europe of Barroso, Europe of Merkel, Europe Summit, Europe, of, it, 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 again, it's not very well defined, unless you don't reach the point where the Commission is actually, the President of the Commission is democratic, elected by, by, by European uh, citizens. And uh, uh, sooner or later, I'm, I'm sure we will come to, to, to this point. You cannot uh, 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 relax the market if you if you still go go go, go on with uh, 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 state uh, deficit, which are sold in different ways by different authorities with different rates on one side, and on the other side you have a common market and, uh, by large extent, a common currency. This is a contradiction that cannot uh, cannot uh, cannot last. You need to federalize. Yeah. The, the deficit, it, it, it is the only way. L let's remember that Japan has something like 200%, 195, something like that, uh, uh, percent of, of deficit. It's 100% owned by uh, Japanese bank. Exactly. And uh, th there is a very strong guarantee behind that. Huh? There is a system which works. The, the deficit of, of Greece, it is something like 2% of uh, EU uh, GDP. Yeah. Huh? But, then but one still it affects so much the, the entire Eurozone. But wouldn't this, in fact, actually move a lot of the problems to a European level that the, that the people find is even more remote from the politicians that they know locally or nationally? So saying that Barroso has to be, um, or whoever Someone was to it. follow, um, uh, would have to be directly elected by the citizens, 
would that really overcome that skepticism that we hear over and over again voiced in your barometer polls, in national politics also currently, um, or especially currently perhaps, um, that it's not about moving also to an administration that is perceived as simply a huge bureaucracy that doesn't deliver what it is supposed to. It's, it's because uh, right now Europe is seen as powerless, I mean there's no clear leader, but if you, if you introduce a position which has a clear leadership mm -hmm. and with a clear impact, and if you talk about uh, uh, fiscal integration and if you talk about uh, uh, Eurobond, it could be even a certain power to tax or to, uh, or to uh, implement uh, policy. Uh, if you create such a job, there will be competition. I mean, there will be competition in order to, uh, to, to, to have this position. Every country will try to have uh, one, uh, of their, uh, uh, one of their political leaders to, uh, to, uh, to achieve that position. And the, this, uh, I mean, this, uh, this interest will, uh, I think, uh, bring uh, public interest to, to this matter. I mean, the, the, the reason why people are, are voting less and less for European Parliament, I mean, uh, for, I think it's uh, less than 43% in 2009, it was 60 something percent uh, uh, 10 years ago, is because people don't see on a day to day basis uh, what is, what's the impact on their life. In fact, it's a lot of impact. I mean, when you wrote something about uh, the roaming charge uh, for mobile phone, I mean, everyone traveling in Europe uh, are impacted by that, but nobody knows it. And it's in the great, I mean, and right now it's not the most important matter for people. But if you create a position of power uh, because of the competition and because it would be a, a competitive process, I think you will create a, a popular interest. I, 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 in, time, in terms of recession, uh, public opinion is always uh, suspicious about uh, politicians, uh, European international national levels as well, uh, and the results of the election are are uh, there. Uh, Merck uh, is not doing well, uh, Sarkozy lost elections, uh, the, the establishment in Greece uh, to a large extent uh, collapsed, initially we, we, we had to go to sort of uh, the technocrats goals and so on, and in Spain the socialists lost elections again, so it is, it is, it is normal. Uh, so uh, I don't think that uh, you're right in saying that people that don't trust Barroso, not at all, uh, but not necessarily people trust their national politicians either. Uh, I'm afraid so. Um, if we do have uh, a real competition for the top positions in the European Union, I think something will actually uh, change in this region because there will be different candidates and different, uh, different programs. And this is the dynamic of uh, so sooner or later we'll have to to accept something something like uh, like that, and if we uh, start to rationalize the, the institutional structures, for instance, one of the proposals that as a political group, as Aldo, we, we did move in, in the Parliament, is to have a high commissioner within the Commission uh, in charge of the economical affairs, with the title also Vice President of the Commission, with the role of representing the European Union in uh, IMF, with the role of chairing the Eurogroup with the roles of coordinating the entire package of different portfolios in the Commission on, on the Economic Fields, which is now completely scattered all those positions with different people, uh, well, you start to have somebody who is much more accountable. One of the problems today, as I said before, is that everybody hides behind somebody else. It, 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 it's never somebody's responsibility. Uh, it is, uh, uh, well, it is the... Uh, Eurogroup uh, president, it is uh, the, the Danish presidency, it is an uh, initiative of Barros, no? it is the initiative of the committee. It, it's always this kind of cacophony which actually doesn't work. You need one person, and of course, you need at least the president of the commission to be elected. People have some hesitations in going to vote for the European Parliament also because uh, they see that uh, the balance of powers between the Parliament on one side and then the Commission and, and, and the Council. Is, is, is frankly not really very, 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 very balanced. It's not very, very, very rational, and uh, you, you, you have to deal with a number of institutions which are, for most of the people, a question mark. Why Barroso is there? Who has appointed Barroso? Who, wh where it comes from? Who, who were the other possible uh, alternatives? Uh, nobody, nobody uh, have, uh, has the answer in the public opinion to to this kind of uh, of, uh, of questions. Uh, although. 
uh, initially, and I, I think uh, the United Kingdom would, would be exactly the same, 72% of the legislation implemented in Italy it is adopted at European level. Yeah? It is it's something that uh, comes from, from Brussels and then the national parliament has uh, simply to, to translate uh, in, into the uh, national uh, uh, national legislation. So uh, on, on so many different aspects uh, uh, today, the daily life is uh, completely affected by uh, European uh, European decision. But again, if I do have to complain something, if I do want to, to propose something to the European government, to Europe as such, I have no address. Uh, the, the point on uh, of having a kind of a finance minister, or whatever we call it, or finance commissioner, is a very good point because right now I'm in Juncker, I, pretty much trying to play this role, but you know, he, he has absolutely no staffing, he has absolutely no resources, uh, he doesn't have uh, necessarily all the information he could have in order to, to take the decision, and uh, again, uh, that, that, that will help to have someone in charge on a specific matter. And Juncker had his own agenda, but not only he didn't have staff and, 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 and resources, but he had to rely and to coordinate himself with Oli Rehn. Oli Rehn had to coordinate himself with Barroso because uh, we don't have Oli Rehn as uh, one like Ashton, uh, uh, high representative for, 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 for economic affairs. He has to rely with the uh, chair, uh, the semestral chairs. He has to rely with Farron Potts. It's a system which is totally uh, absurd. Eh? In, uh, but I think there might be also problems with convincing populations now that going to actually strengthen that system, having had all the debates, having had uh, various conventions, having had uh, so much uh, thought put into these structures and having ended where we are, that now saying that, well, what we need is more of that level, I'm not sure that would actually fly in, in public debates in most countries. But also, there is an alternative um, suggestion that is often being discussed in terms of how national parliaments hold both their um, governments but also their MEPs accountable. You see a person, now I'm shamelessly uh, promoting LSE research on transparency uh, at the EU level, you see that the various political systems that we have in Europe really matter for how negotiations are carried out in Brussels but also how uh, MEPs behave according to either their party um, line or according to their constituency line, which may not necessarily be one and the same. So depending on what electoral system you have for MEPs, they might have incentives to look towards their party leadership or to, the, to their constituencies. And we see that also in voter turnout for European elections, that if you have a candidate to vote for you, may be more likely to come out to vote in the first place, um, uh, contrary to if you simply have to vote for a, a party. So these um, very important democratic uh, questions are not solved at the European level, in my opinion, and the institutions are not really providing them, but I think that the um, uh, sort of line between national politics and European politics is really what has to be better connected and they could easily be better connected. So I would actually disagree with your suggestion for um, it now going to an electing a commission president, but rather uh, looking more from the bottom up uh, as such. I mean, it's true that when you have a list of, uh, you know, when you have a pre-selected list party by party, you don't actually choose who, you, who represents you because you don't know if it will be the top three, the top two, or only the top person being elected. Uh, if, if for, uh, and it's true for, for MP in France, you vote for a certain person instead of a party. Uh, obviously, the, the line of the party is very important. I and mean, uh, in the election uh, here in uh, Northern Europe, uh, people say 78% of them say, that they will vote for the specific party instead of a specific person. But nevertheless, they vote for a person. And, uh, and that will make it a bit more palatable, I think, for, for people. For sure. It's always difficult uh, um, after so many different attempts in order to improve the credibility of European institutions to, to, to convince uh, once again public opinion that the last efforts is necessary, etc. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, but uh, 
I, I don't believe at all personally that uh, the, the, the right answer is in strengthening the national dimension uh, rather than the European dimensions. Um, you, you, you certainly need to have a much more transparency in the work of the European institution, including the work of, the, of members of, of Parliament. And yes, uh, the different uh, electoral laws play, play a role. Uh, it, it needs to have a roughly proportional system with the thresholds, but we also have uh, individual uh, preferences. So uh, you need to not only to be on the list, but then voters have to write the, your family name. Eh? So if you do not write the family name of Rinaldi, uh, I have <laughs> elected to the European Parliament, and I need the 12,000 uh, individual votes in order to, to be elected for, 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 my, for my party, which of course then helps um, members to be to try to be more accountable, to more transparent, to explain what we are trying to achieve in European Parliament, uh, and uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, the magnitude of the problem of the crisis, the different challenges behind also the, the, the economic challenges are such that either we 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 we, we uh, uh, face them, we match them in uh, in. Uh, uh, United uh, uh, European uh, uh, level way, or, or, or I don't think we will be able to 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 be a winning project, and nobody will. I mean, what is the comparative uh, advantage of of China today with European Union? Uh, I, I, as you said, I, I am there in the International Trade Committee, which is an exclusive competence of the European Union. So all the kind of legislation in terms of international trade goes through the Parliament and through the European Union. Individual member states, they don't have anything to do uh, except approving <coughs> in the Council. That, that, that's it. And, and we have so much competition with, uh, with China, for instance, or, or with India. And many people, of course, they, they complain about the much cheaper uh, labor forces in, in China and India, but uh, that's an element. But I think that the, the, the real uh, competitive uh, from China comes from the fact that we are talking about one billion three hundred fifty million people, hmm? and one fiscal policy, one minister of foreign affairs, one labor legislations, one regional cohesion policy, and so on. We are about a bit more than five hundred million people, and we have twenty-seven, soon twenty-eight, plus the EU uh, dimensions, twenty-nine different policies. It will never work. And uh, with the United States, with Brazil, with China. Uh, with India, uh, we, we always have to, to, to face this kind of, uh, of, of problem, both in economic terms, in climate change, uh, in international crimes, in international politics, uh, all, all these kind of, of challenges, uh, and of course, in, uh, in, uh, in, in dealing with, uh, with the financial markets. So practically, if you do more Europe, it, it has to be more Eurozone. It has to be a two-speed two Europe, isn't yeah. it? Okay, so it's, it's a different uh, geography we're actually looking at than I we think you currently can't, I mean, there's no way you will achieve a more integrated, you know, 27 yeah. member EU. I mean, that's, that's, how, that's completely uh, impossible to imagine. I mean, if there were some more integration, that would be, I, you know, if you're optimistic, you say at least as a first step. But in fact, practically, it will be for any remaining uh, Eurozone country. Uh, you, you don't need the fiscal unity with a country which is not a member of, uh, of the Eurozone. Uh, that's, uh, that's very clear. And uh, I, I warn everybody about uh, the, the perspective of going back to a uh, national solution. Um, let's, let's see now what's going to happen with, with Greece. I'm pretty sure that if Greece will be the, the first country uh, leaving the Eurozone, it will be the last country leaving the Eurozone. Because once the other countries will see what's going to happen to Greece uh, if they leave uh, uh, the Eurozone, nobody will either to <laughs> there to, to, to leave the, uh, the Eurozone. I'm pretty sure about, uh, about that. So we'll have to see what happens to the German banks if yes. Greece uh, leave the Eurozone as well. I think okay. that, you know, very drastic uh, 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 suggestions and uh, sort of predictions also for the future, I think that it's time to also invite um, the audience to come up with some questions and uh, uh, perhaps reflect on other aspects to the debate than what has already been covered. Yeah, please. I'm a student here at the uh, European Institute. Um, I, was, I want to get both of your opinion uh, about the newest two of the 
that the EU envis envisages to bridge the democratic gap, the European Citizens Initiative? Oh, yeah. And do you think it truly can empower the European citizens? Uh, and does it have the actual capacity to produce policy change? Or is it more soft effects that we're looking at, you know, uh, fostering European civil society in broader terms? Mm. And many people point to it as um, not strong enough when comparing it with, I don't know, Switzerland and California, where direct democracy has had some pretty good results. Or, and uh, are we supposed to be comparing it with such examples, or is it, like you said, China and, and India for us? Okay. Let's try perhaps okay. to collect a few questions, and then we can um, turn back to to each of you. Um, but just kind of, I, I hear the word community method is, is the way to go forward. Um, I think you were advocating it, and, and your party leader in the parliament, Guy Wuchtad, I can never pronounce his name, um, he, he is one who is consistently at every plenary, I think, has used the phrase more Europe. But uh, I would put it to you that you're advocating for uh, more Europe, and this would be the same Europe that decided to go ahead with the Euro project, even when it was not economically viable, that any economic initiatives that they've had to try to get Europe going, I mean, the Lisbon strategy, the 2020 strategy, have not worked, that they're trying to create homogeneity, economic homogeneity, out of 27 heterogeneous economies. Um, it's actually one of the requirements kind of within the fiscal treaty and the kind of broad economic policy guidelines. And um, how, how can that realistically be a solution when, even if you, there's actually a viral video, I don't know if anyone else has seen it, of the history of Europe over a thousand years, and you'll see that Europe is a, one of the most diverse continents in history that the relatively stable situation we have is very relatively new and that kind of if you're advocating to homogenize all this you're only going to meet with resistance and that potentially your solution may only create more problems I just if you have any kind of wish to expand why you think your way is right vis-a-vis uh, -vis other ways okay. any last questions in this one? yes please uh, I'm Craig from the Liberal International. Uh, thank you both for, for your address. Uh, Mr. Rinaldi, I asked the question to one of your colleagues, uh, Mr. Kermin of Burundi, a Dutch MP, uh, a year ago, a very critical question, uh, because also he was having an address about, about the, the issue of the democratic deficit of Europe. My question to you is, shouldn't MEPs themselves, such as, for example, Somali Tishaku, uh, having been voted most wired politician in Europe uh, the last year, do more to advocate the importance of Europe to their own constituents. Uh, and if you agree, then what have you done yourself? <laughs> okay. I think we might uh, start with uh, you, Nicola, yeah. and then we go ah, pass on to. Uh, well, I can start. I can start by the uh, citizen right here. I mean, the Citizen Rights Initiative, it was uh, passed, what, 1st of April, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, proposal was the uh, 9th of May, uh, Fraternité 2020. Uh, I looked at it uh, earlier today because I wanted to make sure that I really understand it. I mean, it's 20 page and everything. At the end, if you get 1 million people within one year uh, uh, over seven states, you, have, you can put a proposal to the Commission that will look at it carefully. Yeah, good example. No, honestly. So, and they have a certain time frame in order to look at it and to see if they can uh, suggest something out of it. Okay. Do you expect? Do we expect something incredibly important coming from it? If there is a 20 million people signing it, maybe could be. But uh, so far, no one know, knows it. I don't know what is the uh, advertising budget uh, uh, for people to actually uh, being able to know they can do it. Uh, and uh, right now, it, it sounds a bit like a gimmick. I think it's a good thing. Uh, I, I think it could, uh, if people start to know it, if there is some interesting proposal, and if there is some action from the Commission, slowly it could change things. But right now, it's, it's only a way for people to feel uh, they are listened to, uh, even though it's purely cosmetic. But it's a good first step, because you know, if people start to think they have a say, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the perception of, uh, of uh, democratic uh, deficit could change. Uh, 
I'm not sure it is purely cosmetic, <laughs> the European Citizens <laughs> Initiative. It is a first attempt uh, to try to, to address the issue of uh, bottom to top uh, process uh, in, uh, in European treaties. Uh, I think a lot will depend from uh, the, the first shot of the of, of, If it's going to be uh, a, something successful, it, it, many other peoples and many other issues will like come up and there will be an emulation process, I, I, I think. Uh, if nobody is going to use, um, well, uh, it will be there, and for the time being, this is not the only Lisbon Treaty provisions uh, which has been put in the treaty in order to widen a bit more uh, the roles of other actors, uh, such as the Court of Justice, the National Parliament, uh, uh, intergovernmental uh, through the enhanced corporations, uh, uh, corporation, um, uh, which is not fully used. Uh, but I, I think that uh, if citizens uh, uh, organize themselves, uh, and political forces, of course, are also, uh, are also there, uh, it, it cannot be ignored by, by the European institutions. Um, ACTA has been, in my opinion, an extremely interesting case. Uh, it has not been doing, I don't know how familiar you are with this uh, uh, treaty, the anti counterfeiting uh, 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 treaty agreement um, after contemplating the um, well, factor, anyway, uh, agreement, which has been uh, uh, negotiated by the Commission on mandate of the 27 countries, member states, there was unanimity, uh, in order to negotiate with uh, uh, 12, 12 other partners, the European Union being one partner as, as such. For, for the, um, uh, different industrial powers in uh, in the world to have a set of counterfeiting uh, uh, anti-counterfeiting uh, uh, measures. Well, this it has been perceived, in my opinion, rightly so, as also a threat within this treaty to the internet and to the web uh, space. Uh, well, we did receive in the European Parliament 2.5 million signatures of citizens asking not to ratify ACTA. The Parliament has the role to have the role has the role to ratify through the Council procedures uh, this, this agreement, and we decide under the pressure of, uh, of 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 the citizens not to ratify with big uh, hassle with the Commission, with the hassle with the number uh, of, of member states, etc. So uh, and we are talking about counterfeiting. So we have all the uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, behind ACTA. Uh, all the fashion uh, brand, the luxury brands, uh, uh, industry, which are which are there. All the intellectual properties, uh, interest, uh, which are which are there, and so very powerful lobbies. Nevertheless, uh, people people's voice was more successful, and ACTA is basically uh, dead because we are going to have the vote in, uh, in committee at the end of June and plenary in July, and uh, political groups have already expressed themselves, so there is no. No, no majority. So I, I, I think that when people make their voice uh, to the European institutions, well, it is, uh, if it is well done, if it is organized, uh, and the uh, European initiative, uh, 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 citizens' initiative, can be a good channel to, to, to organize uh, forces, uh, it can absolutely make, uh, make, uh, make, make the difference. In my opinion, ACTA has been an, an extremely interesting case because it was, it was really a trans-European campaign in order to stop this kind of, uh, of uh, agreement against the big powers, so, so, so to say. Um, so a question. Uh, on the uh, uh, issue Europe, is uh, there has never been really homogeneity in Europe uh, and the different system, uh, etc. Well, I don't know. In, in, in terms of continental Europe, I see a very much integrated uh, economy uh, to the extent that uh, maybe uh, Greece cannot uh, get out of Europe, cannot leave Europe because of the of the of the of the German banks' uh, uh, situation. So it's so much connected. And in cultural terms, I also see a lot of, uh, of, of interconnections. And even, even the, the, um, the mixed marriages, the, the, the number of people who have moved from one country to another, at least in the European Union, in the, in the continental Europe, is, uh, is huge. It is something which is uh, increasing, increasing with a very, a very, very high rate 
year after, after year. Uh, you're right, a number of European uh, policy uh, has never really uh, been very successful, the uh, 2020 strategy, the Lisbon strategy, uh, they really never made a difference, but there has always been a, a intergovernmental policy, basically, with the role of coordination uh, by the Commission, who was there to overlook, uh, supervise uh, what the, the member states uh, were supposed to do. Uh, so basically, nobody has really done his own uh, uh, homework, and, and nothing really, really, really happened. Uh, both on the 2020, we will see, and particularly with the Lisbon strategy, which has been so far a, a big, a big failure. But uh, all kinds, of, uh, I, I come back. The, the world is changing. China is there. Uh, states are there. Brazil is there. All, all kinds of world challenges uh, can, in my opinion, very clearly uh, be addressed only at. Uh, Supernational level, and Europe is quite homogeneous now as a society. Uh, if you look, for instance, at the potential conflict between the old member states and the new member states following the, 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 the fall of, of the Berlin Wall, so many people were saying, Well, those countries will never integrate with the others. They are, they are coming from decades of communism, uh, so difficult. Oh, Poland the Czech Republic, the, the, the Baltic uh, states, uh, well, with a number of problems, of course, but they, 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 they actually, uh, there has been really a, a unification process which was uh, uh, much more quicker and uh, am uh, amazing than, uh, than, than, than what expected. And whatever you want to achieve, if you want to have a, a financial uh, transaction tax, well, you have to do it at the European level. If you want to have an agreement with Switzerland in order to uh, pay uh, some kind of taxes on uh, on EU citizens' bank accounts in, uh, in in Switzerland. Yes, you can do bilaterally, but if you do at European level, <laughs> you, you get much much better much better uh, conditions. If you want to have some good research uh, and development project, uh, like the Galileo or, or many others, uh, well, either you do at European level or, or, or basically you don't do. If you want to have a competitive uh, Eyeline, uh, uh, aircraft airplanes industry, either you do through consortia such as the Airbus or, 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 or otherwise you are not a, a player in, uh, in the world, uh, in, uh, in the world scene. Uh, what we need is to move from uh, uh, country to country uh, sectorial uh, agreements uh, uh, to something which is much more structured at the European level and again with more uh, accountability. Um, on uh, how you advocate the, the, the need for more Europe. Well, uh, each country has a different uh, uh, political landscape. Uh, in Italy, uh, we need certainly to, to have much more Europe because we have a number of, uh, of uh, um, issues where we are behind Europe, right? and so we need to catch up the, the delay that we, we do have. And each political party, of course, has different solution and different. Uh, but uh, if you go to my website and you can, you see the, the different kind of activities on uh, on the ground that uh, I, I, I have to organize. It is all the time about uh, how to advocate Europe separate. Uh, my personal approach in uh, in uh, I don't know if this is the kind of answer you're looking for, but the kind of technique of the kind of argument which I use to to sell Europe in uh, in in my. My constituency is a very big constituency. It is uh, uh, central, uh, uh, the central part of Italy. So it's uh, four regions uh, from Florence uh, to Rome to the Adriatic coast. So it is about uh, uh, 60 million people constituency. So quite, uh, quite uh, a big, uh, a big constituency. Uh, but first of all, I I try to to. Uh, systematically emphasize uh, the positive uh, uh, phase of Europe, which sometimes it is uh, uh, now a bit uh, uh, left uh, left out. Uh, there is plenty of uh, EU funds that Italy does not use uh, uh, fully, which are there. Uh, we are talking about billions of euro for the, the financial period of 2007 to 2013. Uh, I already organized something like 23 uh, training uh, courses of uh, one full day in order to make people, uh, students in particular, young entrepreneurs, uh, accustomed to this kind of uh, uh, euro projects and euro, euro uh, funding, uh, which you can get from, from Brussels. I work a lot on the collective memory. 
uh, which basically is to, to, to give the floor to people who had a different experience than ours about Europe, so survivors of the Holocaust, so survivors of the Second World, people who are, they, they always have a wonderful message because they say the Europe I, I, I knew when I was a child was that people were Brits killed Germans, Germans killed Italians, French killed, and so on. And, uh, and this is, uh, we, we need also to, 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 to keep this kind of memory in order to, to know from which kind of ruins, all kind of materials and spiritual ruins we, 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 we come from, and to be proud of what has been uh, achieved. Uh, and uh, I, I insist a lot on, uh, on the global challenges, and, uh, as I'm doing uh, now, that there is no future if we, we still want to have uh, our own uh, small flag uh, uh, in order to, 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 address, uh, to address big issues. This I do a lot through the net, a lot. I have my newsletters, I have my two different kind of newsletters every month, through meetings on the ground, I use a lot of videos. Um, videos are very good in order to communicate, at least in Italy, with, with the people, two, three, four minute speech on specific issues, this is what we do, and it goes on YouTube, you, you send out to your uh, mailing list, I have about, uh, not a very big mailing list, but it's about 8,500 people, and they, some of them disseminate fatherly this kind of information. The, the, the traditional, or a bit less traditional uh, ways to, but uh, the message that we need Europe, it is very important. And it is at the core business of, of our activity. And as a political party, uh, national political party, we adopted a 10 points program uh, of proposals for uh, a European economic uh, government, which is based also on the ALDE positions with a number of things which have been also said today. The very first point is that in order to have a uh, European government, you, we need to have the uh, elected the commission, president of the commission, in order to have full democracy, uh, democratic legitimacy. Okay, let me get a few more questions and then uh, give the floor back to yourself. I might then ask you a question actually, because something that um, is obviously very related to democratic representation and legitimacy of political systems in general is um, the challenges that uh, increasingly become apparent at both levels at the moment in terms of um, right wing uh, or indeed extremism uh, in uh, elections. Uh, we've seen it very recently also in Greece with very um, uh, strong uh, representation of, of uh, uh, candidates that would usually uh, not even be allowed to stand for elections in other parts of Europe. Um, and, but at the same time, those, those uh, dynamics are clearly uh, present across Europe by now. Uh, to some degree, um, it's decreasing in the countries that first experienced it. In Scandinavia, it's actually uh, uh, going backwards, one could say, slightly. But at the same time, it now seems that also in uh, the countries that are facing the most difficult times, this uh, is uh, uh, not an issue that is likely to disappear overnight. So in terms of uh, also with the angle of democracy and legitimacy, and uh, I would claim the lack that these kind of uh, politicians uh, come with, what do you expect in terms of uh, mainstream parties' ability to deal with uh, voters uh, running to, towards the extremes on both sides? Um, well, I can start. I mean, it's true that everything started more or less. I mean, it started to become apparent in Finland quite some time ago, and now it's coming back. And extreme vote is a bit, uh, it's a bit uh, less important over there. But uh, we had French election, uh, and what was, what, what was not constant was the, the vote from extreme right and the vote from extreme left. Because one time, they were both very strong. What was constant during the entire election process is the sum of the two were pretty much always around 30%. At the end, uh, Marine Le Pen got 20 and Mélenchon on the left got 10. It could have been 15-15 or it could have been uh, anyway. And in fact, uh, both parties share the common, uh, the common view that uh, uh, they reject in Europe, and uh, Europe is a source of problem for them. And the country should, uh, whatever it's because of the bankers on one side or uh, immigration on the other side, that globalization is a threat, and therefore 
the country have to grow on a, on a standard basis. And the same phenomenon exists, uh, sometimes more on the right, far right, sometimes more on the far left, depending on which country. But we, we see this uh, extreme, uh, extreme vote uh, um, uh, becoming more and more important. One, in period of crisis, usually uh, there is a higher percentage of extreme vote, anyway. But it's true that uh, mainstream politicians for many years uh, did uh, push, uh, uh, you know, they did promote the good achievement of Europe as being their own achievement. And each time there were a problem, or each time there was something that is not uh, satisfactory, uh, we're blaming the, the, the Europe. When obviously a lot of time it was not true. Uh, we can talk about you know, common agricultural policy, for example. Or well, there's a lot of other points where, in fact, uh, the uh, Europe is a scapegoat, and in, in a way, uh, mainstream uh, political party did create, I think, this uh, this phenomenon. Yeah, I agree. I personally am um, not uh, very keen about. Uh, the socialist family and the conservative family, which are the two leaders of the, of the European politics in two years, uh, in terms of being able of undertaking some kind of self-reform uh, in order to be closer to citizens and to be more innovative in, uh, in the political, uh, in political life. And uh, I agree that they, they, they somehow they did create uh, the, the, the conditions for extremes to 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 to, to uh, Also, because there has been a very conservative policy eh, from from both left and uh, and, uh, and and right, uh, the agricultural policies <laughs> exactly very very clear. And I think that the more interesting answer are coming up from uh, the, the Greens, the Liberal Democrats, uh, the Pirates Party, uh, the, this kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of formation which might be uh, much more flexible than, uh, uh, mentally flexible than, uh, than, than the others. Uh, having said that, extremes, uh, extremist parties, they may have a very good uh, uh, electoral result. I don't think they can solve any problem. Uh, they, they, they are a very short term uh, answer. I still have to see one extremist party able to, to actually to deliver something to the population, except uh, the feeling that, well, I, 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 I did take as a, vo as a voter my own revenge uh, against the establishment by voting uh, Le Pen or by voting Open League or by voting uh, is neo-Nazi in Greece, uh, etc. So it is a very short term. Uh, uh, satisfaction, so so to say. Uh, certainly, uh, we need to um, change, uh, upgrade, uh, improve uh, the kind of political communication. And Europe actually is a challenge about that. Uh, coming also back to, to 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 your questions, because the political establishment in Europe is not that used to communicate about Europe. Uh, it has a much more the ability to, to, to speak in, in, in national uh, political slogan terms uh, rather than, uh, than uh, European uh, vision. Uh, I think today uh, people, they don't look uh, that much about uh, the ideological background. They look about personal example. So we need to have personal credibility as, uh, as politicians and, uh, and this is very important in order to attract votes and to go against the, 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 the extremists. And you need to have uh, uh, accountability, really, you need to, to, to explain what you're doing, uh, how you are gaining your salary as a uh, as minister, uh, member of government, member of parliament, uh, and, uh, and so on. To have, uh, uh, and there, of course, there is a lack of uh, good instruments also in order to, 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 to be in the position of being transparent and explaining what you, you, you are doing, but particularly at the European uh, European level, because sometimes it's also difficult because there is not the platform, there is not really the instruments to 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 to, to be uh, transparent, uh, so to say. Uh, finally, I simply say that that I have the feeling that um, citizens uh, traditionally they have been divided in uh, uh, leftist, rightist, uh, young, old, rich, poor. 
urban areas, rural areas, this kind of classic uh, uh, definitions, bourgeoisie, uh, lower class, etc. Uh, I, I, I have the feeling that at least this is true in Italy, but I think it's also true in, uh, in, in Germany. Uh, maybe less in France because there is a very strong social system, but maybe, well, also in France. I think that the, the, the main uh, division now, it is, so to say, with people that at the end of the month, they are sure to have a salary, uh, a pension, uh, some kind of income, uh, high or low, and the people who are obliged to fight every week for uh, their own salary. And those may be uh, students, uh, precarious people, small or medium uh, uh, entrepreneurs who also are maybe very wealthy, but they have no guarantee about their own, uh, their own future. So people, so to say, with net, a kind of net, uh, and people yeah. without uh, uh, a net. Yeah, but uh, what you mean is there's no middle class. Well, it, 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 I, I think it is more tra tra trans, uh, trans classes, so okay. to say, because you can have also wealthy people, so particularly in the business sector, who, well, they are not completely confident about uh, if they, 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 they can really maintain their kind of, uh, of, uh, of level in, in, at the end of the month or two months' time today. Uh, and you have also uh, people who are at the, at the bottom of the, of the social classes, but anyway, they know they have this kind of income because they are uh, uh, state employees or something like that, uh, and well, they are happy with that, and, so, and, and they are conservative. Okay, so right? uncertainty or Absolutely. stable income. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think we have more of a problem in the way Europe decides than a problem of, uh, of democratic legitimacy. And in some cases, the most uh, uh, difficult uh, situations have come because democratically elected institutions have hindered the decision-making process. I think if we compare, for example, the situation in certain contexts, like, for example, telecommunications, where the the relationship is between the European Commission and independent authorities to the uh, economic and financial situation where the relationship is between the European uh, level and uh, elected institutions. We see that we have much more problems there uh, rather than, for example, in, in the cases where, um, where um, the, the liaison is between the Commission and, and the uh, national regulatory authorities where there is no um, democratic process. There are independent institutions that have uh, successfully implemented uh, a pretty consistent regulatory framework. There is a single market, there is a lot of competition and benefit for the consumers. Whereas uh, in, in the financial situation we have a disaster because the governments have retained the power to uh, decide the fiscal policies and we have at the same time one common currency for for many countries, and this is causing a, uh, a problem. So, in the end, it's all about um, ensuring the ability to uh, make effective decisions, uh, rather than asking ourselves whether we, we need more uh, democratic legitimacy. We have to make sure that Europe is able to make decisions that are effective and that we implement a model that, uh, that delivers. Um, because otherwise people will keep perceiving uh, that Europe doesn't really decide on anything or, or leaves us sort of in the middle without reaching the, the, the final goal. Okay, so more of a focus on delivery rather than on which, which institutions are we, to deliver. We should implement a consistent model where everyone aligns to what is generally decided if we decide to delegate certain powers to the European institutions. It, it's the same problem that we have had in another contest with the, uh, the United Nations, where different states can, can veto uh, a decision and nothing is decided. Okay. One more question. Yeah. Well, <coughs> on my side, um, why, um, I mean, are we, are we really so sure that it would be that, uh, talking from the point of view of the population of Greece, um, are we so sure that it would be so bad for it to exit Europe or even to default? Uh, is it not possible that maybe, this maybe that the growth real process like Iceland, for example, where actually they elected their own, um, you know, popular 
uh, constituents or the last thing they were there to the uh, new laws for themselves uh, without considering like exiting Europe as a community, which is, you know, from the point of view of uh, them, themselves as a people being able to actually be empowered of their own lives and the direction. So, why, why, why would it be different for these? Yeah. Yes. Very last uh, question. I yes, yes. Um, it's a really interesting question. Uh, it's really interesting. I was wondering um, if the members' governments are wants to clarify the institution and to simplify the institution and to, to do something about that. Because uh, I think now the population have the feeling that Europe is doing a lot and that a lot of decisions uh, and in period of crisis, I think the population is aware that Europe is taking a lot of decisions, but they um, they don't know if it was exactly, exactly what you're saying, that if it's the Commission, if the Parliament, who, who are the decisions that we from, that we are the national government, and they want to do something to, to simplify the, all the process and all the... Okay. Uh, first of all, more democracy doesn't mean a lot of success. In, uh, in the long term, yes, but in the short term, it doesn't mean a lot. It's not because you have a fantastic democratic system that you guarantee success. Which is um, uh, about uh, the euro crisis today, in fact, you could argue that back in '97, with the uh, growth and stability pact, you had, in fact, the tool. Uh, that uh, was supposed to prevent what happened today. Uh, and in fact, no one, well, after a few years, no one did respect it. I mean, not France, but Germany, and obviously uh, no uh, uh, peripheral country. So the problem was not really, in this specific matter, was not really, uh, uh, is the uh, construction of the Eurozone wrong? Because in a way, you can't have a single currency if you don't have a, a single budget, etc. Uh, in fact, there were some tools already there, but what we didn't have, is the willingness to implement control uh, uh, either via some authority in Europe or exactly. via, in fact, government. Practically, every government wanted to breach uh, this uh, pact uh, as quickly as possible because exactly. the cost of funding was so low, uh, it was madness not to, uh, not to take advantage of it. So, uh, the, the, the problem of the Eurozone, uh, we had the tool at the time to uh, to prevent that. Uh, the, if, if we are in the situation we are today, it's because each government uh, lack, they, they didn't have the, uh, the willingness to, uh, first of all, make sure that for themselves they would respect it, and more uh, uh, to make sure that uh, to pressure on the other government not to do it. Because it was not seen, you know, you have to, I mean, it's very easy in hindsight now to say that, but you have to remember that back in 2005 or 2000, in the year 2000 and so on, all the growth were in Spain, were in uh, all those peripheral countries, and Germany was the, the, sick, uh, the sick man of Europe. So, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's not difficult, but at least what we know, it's, uh, uh, there were lack of uh, organization or willingness to implement what, we, what has been decided. Uh, in terms of Greece, I mean, Greece, uh, the problem of Greece, I mean, they, I'm not going to solve the Greek problem in five minutes, but one of the main problems of Greece is the, uh, the fact that the productivity gap versus Germany in the last 10 years moved by 40%. So it takes, it's way too expensive to produce anything in Greece compared to any other country in Europe. I mean, whatever it's, it's not only the minimum wage, but it's the minimum wage, it's the cost of labor, the inflexibility of labor, the taxation of labor, and so on. Uh, Greece could solve this problem by devaluing the, uh, the currency right away. If the currency were, uh, you know, were 50% lower, the cost, there will be massive inflation, they will be not be able to import because they're relying on import for medicine, for oil, for a lot of things, to create a lot of problems. Uh, but you know, you, one could argue that it could be a solution. Uh, Iceland is not the, 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 it's a completely different thing. Iceland, uh, the country itself didn't run a massive deficit. Uh, they had a banking system. And contrary to Ireland, they didn't choose to save their banks. And in fact, first of all, not because it was, I mean, I think it was a, a 
pragmatic choice, but they couldn't even afford to. to in fact, they didn't have a lot of choice. Ireland, they think they could, and probably they can, uh, but uh, uh, they, they chose the other way. The only thing that we could compare uh, Greece to another country would be Argentina. Uh, but if you, uh, if you default like Argentina, you know, it means that you default uh, Friday midnight, you close all the frontier, you take every big, every bank bills, you make a mark on it to make sure that if it goes outside the country, it still stays track mark. Uh, every bank account in a foreign currency are denominated in local currency at uh, whatever, at a specific rate, which is advantageous. Obviously, all your bank go bust. Most of your company go bust. Everyone with a debt in, a, a, let's say, a UK law, uh, a non-Greek law uh, will, uh, will be fraught. It's something possible, but it, I mean, I can't see, I mean, Argentina did it, and in fact, now they're better off. I mean, we had a community boom since then, so it's very difficult to know these are the community boom, if they, what would be the situation. But it's, uh, I can't imagine, you know, you have to have an organized government in order to do all those things. And right now, there is no organized government in Greece. So they, even that, I can't, I mean, it will be, they will not be able to achieve that by themselves. Uh, national and um, technical authorities, etc. Yes, they deliver much, uh, much better. Um, but uh, they, they, they can deliver, and they should deliver just on, on technical uh, stuff and nothing, nothing else. In the sense, I, 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 democracy is always more complex. It's more difficult, uh, uh, clearly. But I think it is an exercise that uh, it's worth to 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 be to be pursued. Um, in India, I'm a rapporteur on the free trade agreement with India, for instance, European Union and free trade and, and, and India. In India, the parliament has not ratified such an important agreement, eh? free trade agreement. It's a lot of consequences in terms of job creation and job losses on both countries, etc. It is a decision which is entirely in the hands of the government and, and, full, and full stop. We have to ratify yeah, at the parliamentary level. Well, that, of course, it makes much longer the procedures, but you have to talk with all the stakeholders, different unions, different associations, etc. And I think that at the end, the kind of package that you, you, you have to negotiate is much better for, for the society. Because uh, I, I, I don't trust, although I come from exactly that background, I don't trust the technocrats, uh, European technocrats, uh, Eurocrats, in order to, to, to be the ones who always know best. Uh, if ACTA was not to be uh, ratified by the European Parliament, it would have been uh, simply ratified by, by an agency uh, or by the Commission. Uh, and then we, now we will complain about internet freedom, threat to free, free speech in, in the web, etc. So uh, I think it is important to, to to, to maintain this uh, European uh, uh, characteristic uh, uh, that uh, democracy is, uh, is, uh, is one of our uh, flag, with all the difficulties and contradictions and uh, delay in, the, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in delivering that uh, we, 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 we might uh, have. Then, of course, technical decisions should be entirely in the hands of the, uh, of the agency, but we will never get roaming reductions. Uh, if it was uh, to be done uh, at uh, the telecommunication uh, agency level and not by uh, through legislative uh, process. Uh, Greece, uh, I absolutely agree with uh, with, with, with Jenny. Um, if uh, Greece, uh, I, I fully understand that the Greek uh, people desire to leave the euro and to say we are fed up, basta. Uh, this is uh, something absolutely oppressive as a system. We are catching in a, in a, in a trap and we need to, to get out of, of that. And as uh, ALDE, uh, we don't support the, the uh, ECA and the Troika approach to, to Greece. We, if you go to the website, there is no time now to, to explain what is our alternative proposals, but uh, we, we think that all the money that goes to the bank should, the banks should go actually in order to fund projects, uh, investments uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Greece, uh, to have a sort of Marshall Fund support for Greece rather than anything else. But, but if Greece would leave the, the euro, uh, then nobody is going to, to give money to, to, to the government. There is no money to pay the pensions, there is no money to, to pay the, the, the employees. It is that simple. 
uh, Iceland is a very different case, as Yannick was saying. I Ireland has uh, energy, has raw materials. Greece has to import, like Italy, everything. And it has to, to, to import uh, with the devaluation of drachma, coming back to drachma, to an absolutely astronomic uh, price, which is, uh, which is not affordable. In Argentine, in Argentine, you, you had 40% of people below the threshold of poverty uh, following the, the default. It, it, it is extremely suffering, uh, very painful uh, process, which uh, with all the kind of uh, unbalance of the Greek society, very restricted top society, able to keep all the privileged and, uh, and in, in their own hands, and then a lot of people who are struggling for, for their lives, I am not sure it's exactly the, the, the solution for, for, for Greece. Uh, and again, uh, if we would have more Europe, the kind of debt of, of Greece would actually be uh, absorbed by a, 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 a fiscal and, 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 and uh, European uh, budget policy uh, much easier than, uh, than, than would be the case for other countries, because in, in absolute terms you are talking about uh, relatively small uh, figures. This is what made me uh, extremely upset because there is a solution actually. It is not that the big problems that, that, that the Greek case if you put that in the European, uh, in the full European uh, frameworks. About uh, simplify uh, procedures, well member states uh, or at least this kind of uh, uh, governments uh, that we do have, they struggle for their own uh, uh, prerogatives. Uh, they want to keep their voices to, 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 to be heard, uh, etc. Uh, on, on one side, they are not taken seriously by the states, the Department of States, as I was saying before, etc. Uh, but nevertheless, they want to give their own input, etc. So they, they, they are not very keen in simplifying uh, the procedures. They, they, everything has to be for the time being through the intergovernmental but procedure. But it, it is just for, for fun, in a sense. It is just for for the outlook, because uh, there is no really substance, because actually the substance is decided by the market and it is decided by some kind of European approach which actually do limit uh, national, national uh, sovereignty. Um, I, I hope uh, Europe will come to reason on, on that, and sooner rather than later. Okay, I think on uh, that uh, strong last remark, um, it's time to finish the debate and uh, I'm not making any attempt to summarize everything we've talked about because we've covered a lot of ground. So I'd simply say thank you very much to the European Society, uh, the European Society for organizing the event and thank you to both of you for, for coming. Non c'è in io, eh? Ok, è in italiano o in inglese? In italiano. Allora, come è andato questo incontro London School oggi a Londra? Ma credo fosse bene parlare in, uh, a Londra, in, insomma, in un paese che non appartiene alla zona euro e che sta sempre più, è sempre più recalcitante rispetto a un'integrazione economica, parlare invece dell'esigenza di più Europa e di maggiore legittimità democratica come uniche strade per uscire dalla crisi. E io ho insistito anche su quella che è la posizione dell'Italia dei Valori, abbiamo adottato questo pacchetto di 10 proposte per un governo economico dell'Europa che parte proprio da un approccio completamente diverso rispetto a quanto abbiamo adesso, vuol dire dall'elezione a suffragio universale del Presidente della Commissione in modo da permettere ai cittadini di scegliersi il proprio Presidente della Commissione scegliendolo anche tra candidati a quel punto alternativi con programmi e visioni diverse da una parte e dall'altra di permettere a un'entità europea di poter avere comunque insieme al Parlamento eh, europeo eh, una maggiore autorità con un'investitura democratica in modo da prendere per le redini la, la difficile crisi che si sta affrontando. Grazie, perfetto.